Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, TPI seminar. Uh, it continues sort of our seminars from last week of another quantum chemist. It gives me my great pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Johnson from the University of Laval. I won't try my French pronunciation. So Paul um, received his BSc degree from Carleton University, and then he did um, and Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, if I get the details incorrect, a joint PhD between McMaster University with Paul Ayers and the University of Ghent in uh, Belgium with um, Van Neck and, and Boltnick. And then he did a PDF with uh, Gus, Gus Scuseria at Rice University before returning back to Canada at Laval where he now is. And he's gonna tell us about um, some simple models for treatment of strong electron correlation. So Paul, take it away. Thank you very much, Alex. And thank you for inviting me to give this seminar. So as, as Alex said, I've been at Laval for a few years now. And research is going well enough that uh, I can give you a presentation about what we've been doing. So, oh, we have to have our, there we go, okay. So quantum chemistry, and I know not everyone in the audience is in chemistry or quantum chemists in particular. So it's it's really it's established now. It's routine to compute properties and geometries, reaction energies for a lot of things. Lots of software package, packages exist. You can pay for them, or you can find some that are not paywalled. And you can use them fairly effectively to solve Schrodinger equations, which is what you need to do for chemistry. Unfortunately, for a lot of systems, this doesn't really work. Methods fail pretty badly if they fall outside the area where they're applicable. So what we want to be able to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is predict properties for interesting materials that fall outside this area. In particular, things like molecular magnetism, uh, superconductivity is a, a prototypical example. And we want to be able to predict these things in a computer in a numerical calculation without having to do anything in the lab. Of course, this is always just an approximation of reality, so you'd have to prove it experimentally, but we want to get the, the methods to a stage where we could, in principle, predict them. So this is a very difficult electronic structure problem, which is what we're working on. There's lots of other effects that you need to take into account as well. For now, we're going to focus on the electronic structure thing, because that's one part that we feel we can reasonably attack for now. Relativity is not a huge effect for chemistry, but it is important. Uh, there are ways to add it post hoc, or you can just account for it at the beginning in adapting your theory. And finally, there's things you need to worry about at finite temperature, because molecular magnetism and superconductivity are temperature dependent phenomena. They stop at certain temperatures and they start at certain temperatures. So you need to do these giant calculations at a finite temperature, which becomes much more complicated. So uh, what is molecule? It's nuclei, which are positively charged, surrounded by electronic density, which is negatively charged. And the electron density forms around the positive charges. So unfortunately, chemistry is a very small effect. The energy differences on the scale of energies is pretty small. So we need to be very precise with our answers. And for our methods to be applicable, they need to be precise, cheap, and really anybody should be able to use them. You should not have to be a specialist to be able to use it. Okay, so what we are solving is a time, time independent Schrodinger equation. The Hamiltonian H takes into account all the uh, contributions to the energy. So in particular, the kinetic energy of the electrons the interaction of electrons with the nuclei and the interelectronic repulsion. So there's a lot of practical approximations already baked into this picture. So the nuclei do not move. There's no relativity, blah, blah, blah. And the nuclei are just point charges. Now, these are reasonable approximations. And even with these reasonable approximations, we have a tremendous difficulty. So what we want to develop as solutions are things that are precise enough that we get the correct results. They should be cheap enough that we can actually do the calculation for a big system. Otherwise, it's fine to use as reference data, but it's not going to be usable for the things we want to model. And really, we want anyone to be able to use these methods. You should not have to be a specialist to just do the calculation. 
most importantly, we want to get the right answer for the right reason. And that that's, uh, has a lot of baked, that has a lot of uh, history baked into it. So we'll just move past. Okay, so the practical method for solution in chemistry is usually you treat electrons as being independent. And this is a reasonable first approximation for chemistry or a lot of chemistry, I should say. It scales very well and it is a starting point for all the corrections. The exact answer is you brute force diagonalize the solution. So you take a complete, a complete basis and you write the Hamiltonian in that basis, which becomes a gigantic matrix and you diagonalize that matrix. And that is the exact answer. So the difference between those two pictures where the electrons have no interaction between them, that's hartree flock and the exact answer is the correlation. So if hartree flock is a good first approximation, if it's qualitatively correct, we say the correlation is weak. And we say it is strong if that is not the case. Now, I guarantee you that is the most controversial thing I will say today, the breaking of correlation between weak and strong. The viewpoint we take is that if hartree flock is reasonably uh, is a reasonable first approximation, then correlation is weak. <clears throat> so a lot of effects in chemistry fall into the weak correlation regime. For example, dispersion, which is a weakly correlated effect. If the molecule has one dominant resonance structure or one dominant molecular orbital picture, those are not the same thing. These are weakly correlated or if the homo lumo gap is large compared with the uh, electronic propulsion, specifically the valence electrons, blah, blah, blah. For other types of materials, for example, when you stretch or break a bond, when you have rigidly coupled motion of electrons, a prototypical example being the SN2 transition state, there you have two electrons that move, which cause two other electrons to move directly. So they are rigidly coupled. When there are many resonance structures that are important, when the homo lumo gap is small compared to inter-electronic repulsion, so that uh, the loma is not zero populated, or in any situation where you find yourself asking how many bonds are there. In such situations, it is not, it is not usually a productive question to ask how many bonds there are because it is no longer a good concept because the electrons are strongly correlated. So as an example of that type of thing, we hit, we, we are forced to look at very real, all the time observable molecules to do high level calculations, such as carbon. Uh, okay, I got out of sequence there. We're gonna look at the wave function in either case first. My mistake, apologies. Okay, so for weakly correlated systems, it's the case that hartree flock which is one molecular orbital diagram, those are synonymous, is a very good first approximation so that the physical wave function you can write as a short expansion in that picture. The dominant contribution is from hartree flock with small contributions coming from other molecular orbital diagrams. So this is the, the way we solve any difficult problem is we break it down into an easy problem that we can solve exactly that is close to the right answer. And then we add on small correction systematically. So density functional theory and couple cluster theory are very good treatments for weakly correlated systems. They are standard. They are implemented in many commercial packages and you can use them without knowing really anything special about the system. On the other hand, strongly correlated systems are different. There are many molecular orbital diagrams that contribute substantially. There is not one that is dominant or there is, there are many that contribute equally and they are the ones that are important. There are methods that exist to uh, treat these kinds of systems, but they're more difficult to use. And then you have the weak correlation that gets added on top. So this is a more, this is a different kind of problem. It does not fit into the picture of hartree flock plus correction. We need to develop things that are different. So where I got off track before I apologize is the types of systems that we have to look at for these types of things are not things that you would observe in the lab usually. Why is that? Because they need to be small enough that we have good reference data and that we can run our uh, hopefully good calculations against them because we don't have optimal numerical algorithms yet. So strongly correlated systems, anything that is not just describable as independent electrons. So one of these very real systems that we look at is carbon two. It is not productive to answer it. Well, this is political. Uh, it is a good, it is a question of how many bonds there are. I would answer, I would argue it's not a productive question. 
it is a very complicated system. There are a lot of things that are going on, especially in the region in the middle. At equilibrium, it's okay, but even just a little past equilibrium, it changes. And at dissociation, it's okay, but in the middle, it is complicated. So this is a very difficult problem and one of the model systems we would like to be able to treat very well. Okay, so for methods for weak correlation, as I said, they're well established. hartree flock is qualitatively the correct answer. The first correction, which is MP2, is very good usually. A couple clusters is excellent, and you can see there's a scaling associated with these. And then there's a whole slew of cohen sham DFT methods, which are very good as well. So this problem is well understood, and we can systematically improve our results. Strongly correlated systems is not really the case. hartree flock is bad, and its corrections are usually even worse, and sometimes diverge. Uh, cohen sham DFT has a question mark, because I like to be politically correct about that. But the methods that are traditionally associated with strongly correlated systems are based on choosing which molecular orbital diagrams are important, but you have to know beforehand which those are, and it gets very tricky. So their accuracy depends on how well you run the calculation, and so does the scale. Again, full CI is still the exact answer, but scales exponentially. So these types of systems don't really have a lot of good methods that are usable by everyone. So as a long-term goal, we have these giant systems. So 750 electrons is well beyond the capability of things like cas SEF, I would argue. There is a large spin because there is blue manganese centers and there are green manganese centers that have different spin states and they couple. There's lots of anti-ferromagnetic effects happening. And because this is molecular magnet, there's a thermal contribution. There's a thermal problem as well because there's a transition between magnet and non-magnet at a finite temperature. Because of that, there are many states that are in the range of uh, accessibility. The manganese acetate is just the start. Because if you want to look at more interesting systems like neptunium and uranium clusters, you have heavier things, you have relativistic effects, and you have finite size nuclei that you will need to account for. So we want to predict the behavior of these things, as we said in the beginning. Again, there's a very strong, uh, difficult strong electron correlation problem. We're going to focus on that. There's finite temperature, and there's effects of special relativity. So we're going to focus for the next answer cycle or a few on the strongly correlated electronic structure problem. OK, so the approach taken for most solutions of difficult problems is we break it down into an easy problem we can solve very well and small corrections. If the easy problem we can solve very well is a reasonable approximation to the right answer, this approach will do well. So for weakly correlated systems, this is hartree fock plus small corrections. Can we do the same thing for strongly correlated systems? So this is necessarily gonna force us to break strongly correlated systems into different subclasses and Having done that, we can subdivide the problem and make measurable progress. So that's what we're going to do. And the idea is that we're going to solve, we're going to take systems that we can solve exactly easily and then build corrections systematically based on that starting point. So my postdoc advisor is trying to do this based on what we call the anti symmetrized general power or from using broken symmetry mean field things. The way we are doing it is from using exact solutions from model systems that we can solve exactly. Generally, they are solvable by something called the beta ensembles. Okay, so that's that's all well and good. Let's say a condensed matter physicist would tell you directly that you should use a Green's function rather than a wave function. Yes, we agree. We are moving in that direction. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but I'm just pointing out that there is a gigantic literature of exactly solvable models. Even the name is not being so precise. There are a lot of them, and they are built upon well-defined structures. The ones we are using are built upon Lie algebras, but this is also a subclass of things that are built upon Hopf algebras, which we won't talk about. And the models that are solvable by those things are things that we know, like Heisenberg models, Hubbard models, or things from two-dimensional statistical mechanics. Those are subclasses of something that is solvable by a, spe a special kind of separation of variables, which is the direction that we are moving in in the long term. And the point is that to use one of these things, we need a solution to three separate problems. We need to be able to solve the model cheaply and reliably. We need to be able to express 
uh, our system in the language of the exactly solvable model. And we need to have cheap formulas for the, the wave function or scalar products in each of these models. So there's, those are three very different things. The first is a numerical method. The second is, a, for our case, very easy. And the third is a lot of analysis. So we are using, for now, an exactly solvable model based on pairs of electrons. We are not the first to do this, but we are the first to use it as an exactly solvable model starting point. So pairs are built upon a Lie algebra of SU2. Now, this is something that all chemists do see in their undergrad, though we don't usually call it this. We have three objects. We can make a pair with S plus. We can remove a pair with S minus, or we can count the number of pairs with SZ. These three objects have well-defined commutators, and it's just the same thing as a spin algebra. And this extends to any number of levels. So in each orbital, we can create a pair, we can remove a pair, and we can count the number of pairs. And with those three things, we will build the exactly solvable model and our wave function and everything associated with it. So we can either make a pair locally in one orbital or globally delocalized across all the orbitals. Okay, so the exactly solvable model we are looking at. There are two effects. There is a fill it, there is alpha filling of the lowest levels, which is the first term. You fill the lowest levels to minimize the energy. But there is also a, a pair interaction that has a constant value. It has to be a constant for this to be exactly solvable. And there's those are the two effects that compete. So I will tell you that the eigenvectors look like products of pairs. And the pairs are structured as the simple pair objects divided by a, a number u to minus a number epsilon. The epsilons are the single particle energies that define the alpha filling. OK, so it's not difficult to show that these are eigenvectors. You act with h on this vector, and you get one term that, that is proportional and a whole bunch of other terms that are not. So this is an eigenvector, provided the other terms are 0. And that leads to a system of nonlinear equations you have to solve for the numbers u. And you need to have a way of doing that cheaply and effectively. And that problem has been solved, not by me, but by several other very smart people. Stain is one of them. He's in the audience. So we can solve this model very easily, thousands of times, thousands of times. And each of the states is defined by a completely distinct set of numbers. That is something that is not the same as for hartree fock where the same numbers determine all of the, ve the vectors. So that is an unfortunate complication. OK. We need to be able to use these wave functions to develop. Uh, we need to be able to, do, to express scalar products and matrix elements in, in terms of these wave functions. Thankfully, there is a very uh, usable theorem where a scalar product between two vectors of this type is just a function of u and v times a determinant of another set of functions of u and v. And we have become very good at using the scalar product in many different ways. So you get the norm of this state by taking the limit that the two sets of numbers are the same. And that, that becomes just the determinant of a well-structured matrix. And the elements of that matrix have a very nice physical interpretation. So generally, a nice result. Then you need to evaluate the one and two body density matrices between these vectors. You get a sum of, of contributions. Those contributions end up being ratios of determinants that differ by a single column. Ratios of determinants that differ by a single column can be related very easily through Kramer's rule to solutions of linear equations. And those solutions of linear equations just end up being derivatives of u with respect to epsilon. So that is a very, very clean result. And I would hesitate. Well, it's so clean that I doubt that there's a more effective solution to this part of the problem than that. So we can compute these things very easily, again, thousands of times, thousands of times. There's a lot of details that we won't cover, but suffice it to say that most of the time in these projects is spent dealing with these details. So there's details to do with combinatorics, analysis, because you can see that these things are rational functions of complex numbers. There's a lot of linear algebra involved. And then at the end, there's lots of numerical analysis involved. So lots of details. That being said, let's look at some results, because that's why we're here. So these, these wave functions are built from pairs of electrons. And as such, 
every if we expanded this wave function slated determinants, each contribution would have fully paired electrons, which means that in each site we either have a pair of electrons or we have zero electrons. There are other terms in the full CI wave function where we have broken pairs of electrons or multiple broken pairs of electrons. The best case scenario for us is when we only have fully paired electrons. So we, we classify these, uh, these situations by the number of broken pairs, we call that seniority. And what we are doing is an approximation to all the diagrams of this type. Later on, we can incorporate the other diagrams. For now, we're happy with this. So we're gonna to compare to doubly occupied configuration interaction, which is a wave function with only diagrams of this type. Okay, uh, I should just say doubly occupied configuration interaction also scales exponentially. So already that's an intractable problem. Okay, so very simple example of a strongly correlated system is an atom with four electrons. Because the, the 2s 2p gap closes and you need contributions from all the pair excitations in the 2p level as in addition to the 2s level. So all of those diagrams are going to contribute meaningfully to the, the exact wave function. So Doki is very good. It gets practically all the correlation energy, as is variational Richardson Godin. So four electron atoms strongly correlated. This is not a very interesting strongly correlated system. It's just the first example. But we can compare this to 10 electron atoms, which are weakly correlated because the weak contributions to the wave function will come from the 3s level. And there is a giant gap between 2p and 3s. So this is weakly correlated. And Doki does not get a lot of the correlation energy. And hence, neither does Richardson go in. OK, so that, that's first example. We can work on that later on. Usually, or all the other systems that we treat, because atoms are not very interesting, we treat molecular dissociation. Why? Because at equilibrium, there is only one molecular orbital diagram that is important. So it's hartree fock plus small correction. But at dissociation, there are many that are important. For hydrogen too, there are two that are important. There's this one and there's that one, and they're exactly degenerate. So hartree fock which is in gray, is terrible. Density functional theory in a restricted basis is also terrible. And MP2 diverges, because there are two things that are exactly to generate the energy denominator goes to minus infinity. So this is a difficult system for standard methods. If we look at H2 with RHF, you can see it's terrible. We do RG, and it's the same as Doki and full CI. So for a two-electron problem, we get it perfect. This is not so interesting because we're using a two electron wave function to, to try a two electron problem. It should not be too surprising we get it exact. So we can go to hydrogen four. Uh, we have to have the right context. Hydrogen four dissociation where we have, uh, we have four hydrogens and they separate all at the same speed at the same distance. This is a, another strongly correlated system that is harder. A dissociation is very difficult. At equilibrium, it's hartree fock plus correction. And in the middle, it's complicated. So Doki is pretty much perfect. It's almost full CI. RG is less good. And we understand now why it is less good. So in the middle, in the so-called recoupling region, there are many slated determinants that are important. There are more than one RG state that is important too. So if we think in terms of RG states, we have an avoided crossing in the energy. So we are going to need more than one RG state to get this curve correct. We can see this more clearly if we look at H6, which is the same thing, just with an extra hydrogen molecule. The shoulder gets much worse. Doki and FCI are still pretty close, but RG is worse. And this gets even worse as we go to H8. And this is pretty egregious, I would even say. So. At equilibrium, we get the result correct. At dissociation, we get the result correct. I'm happy about those two limits. In the middle, in the recoupling region, it's very difficult. We do not get it correct. So that is something that will need to be worked on. 
The other type of system we look at is things like nitrogen two. Nitrogen two is harder. It is harder because at equilibrium it's fine, but at dissociation we have we have coupled quadruplets. We do not have we do not have a seniority zero thing. So Doki and full CI are not even close. There's a huge gap between them. At least RG is close to Doki for most of the curve. There is still a curve crossing in the recoupling region, so we're going to need more than one dissociate, more than one RG curve to get this correct. And there is a second uh, curve crossing between five and six uh, bore, so we're going to need more than one RG state to get this correct for the entire curve. That is reasonable. Okay, so for the quantum chemists in the audience, you will know that restricted Hartree Fock is not the only thing you can do. You can sort of fix this by using unrestricted orbitals, which means that you treat the up and down spin electrons separately. So you can do the same thing. And for RG is much better. So I don't have the HA curve yet, but at least physically, you can see that the RG curve, the, the unrestricted rich single day curve in yellow is much closer to the correct results. There is still like, I mean, there's no shoulder in the H4 curve. There's no shoulder in the H6 curve. Physically, or qualitatively, we're in the correct uh, description. But using unrestricted orbitals is fine if all you care about is the energy. But any other property you want to compute will likely not be as good. And there's a good reason for this. And it's that you're breaking a physical symmetry that the, the real wave function respects. So what is going to happen is that uh, properties that you compute with this wave function don't necessarily mean anything. Again, if all you care about is the energy, this is fine. And we are very close to having the HA curve done as well. This is a difficult overall optimization, I'll just tell you. Okay, so the conclusions here is that, again, if all you care about is the energy, you can do unrestricted. Otherwise, we need more than one RG state to do this correct. So what does this mean? We need to be able to compute the matrix elements between RG states. The results are nice. It is a lot less clean than just the case between one RG state and itself. The reason is you have determinants that, again, differ by only one column, but the one that shows up in the denominator is singular. So if you take the rate, I mean, you have a denominator that goes to zero. So that, that's going to cause problems if you look at it that way. Otherwise, you just have to compute a lot of determinants. Luckily, there is an analog of, the, of an Aufbau principle. There is a well-defined richardson godin ground state. And then from there, you can define singles in air quotes and doubles, et cetera. However, each RG state couples with each other RG state through the Hamiltonian. So this, this is something that does not happen for Hartree-Fock. For Hartree-Fock, the wave functions are slated determinants. And slater determinants differing by more than two electrons do not couple through the Hamiltonian. Their overlap is zero. That is not the case here. So there is overlap, but we showed that these things actually aren't so important. They are non-zero, but they diminish in quantity fairly rapidly. Okay, so for example, for a system with four orbitals or four sites, if you will, that has two pairs, you can label the states accordingly. The ground state is 1100 0, 0, obtained by placing the first two pairs in the lowest energy orbitals. Those, are, those things then couple through uh, the nonlinear equations, but that is the first order behavior. Singles are defined as one zero change with one zero, sorry, one zero change with one one from one one zero zero. So the singles would be. 1010, 1001, et cetera. And then the one double excitation is 0011. Okay, so there are two types of couplings to the Hamiltonian. The singles are the most important, and then the doubles are less important, but non zero. So for two pairs and four sites, the, the, these are the, the couplings to the Hamiltonian. We, we computed some bigger systems because this is not at all definitive. So for a system with 10, 10 sites and five pairs, we computed all of the couplings through the Hamiltonian. The singles are by far the most important. The doubles are non-zero and are second in importance. 
there are many more doubles than singles. The triples are much less important. You can see that they're non-zero, but they're much less important. The quadruples and quintuples are plotted, but they have almost zero contribution. So the point is that even though all RG states couple with all other RG states through a Hamiltonian, the importance goes, goes down fairly quickly. So we can conceivably write a wave function that is ground state plus RG singles plus RG doubles, et cetera. And that will give smaller and smaller contributions. Okay. There was another part of this paper where we we tried to write the, the RG pairs in the basis of beta ansatz quasi particles. I'm not defining this at all because it was less impressive. The, the contributions get less important as they go along, but there were a lot of problems involved with this. So we're just going to brush past it quickly. The point is still the singles are the most important followed by the doubles, et cetera. You will notice that this is plotted log logarithmically so that these curves actually are quite separate. Okay, so the point is, while for weakly correlated systems, we can write the wave function as hartree fock plus small corrections, and that should converge in quotes reasonably well if hartree fock is a good approximation. We have tried to do the same thing for rich Zangoda. We have applied it to uh, some small systems. I do not have the curves for uh, the ground state plus singles, but they are much closer than the ones that I presented for just rich Zangoda and ground state. That there is still an alpha principle suggests that we can uh, improve systematically in this picture, provided that rich Singodian is a reasonable first approximation. So we can diagonalize the matrix of rich Singoda plus its single excitations with a cost of n to the sixth. It is a matrix of size n squared. The, there's a, an issue here that I haven't touched on is that to build all the singles costs more than that, but I'm pretty sure we can get it down to something reasonable. Eventually this will become Doki because the, the basis is, well, the number of states, the number of degrees of freedom in the space is the same and it's the same states. So rich as I go to NCI will eventually become Doki. Perturbation theories will need to be truncated rather than automatically having higher order terms go to zero. I think that's reasonable as the higher energy, the higher excitation levels of RG states have overlaps that are non zero but are not big. And we can add weak correlation afterwards. So for now, we've done the first order behavior in these things. We've added orbital optimization to look at some curves, and we've done uh, rich singleton plus singles. The, the results are computed, and we're going to publish them soon. Okay, so we do a lot of pencil and paperwork for a, in our group, but in the end, we need to implement these things and compute numerical results with them. And I have had to learn, and you, a lot of people will very rightly laugh at me because this is something you should learn early, that computers are not magic. So for example, a matrix with elements one over epsilon minus u has a known inverse, it doesn't matter what these numbers epsilon and u are, it just matters if it's square. The inverse of that matrix has a specific form and you can show that fairly easily, which we'll do on this slide. So to show that, that uh, these two matrices are inverses of one another, you need to compute sums like the one shown here. So these matrices are inverses, the element of this sum, the, the outcome of this sum should just be delta ij. Okay, so you can show this on paper. You can say that this sum is really just the is the result of a contour integral evaluated at specific residues. So it is, in particular, the result of a contour uh, that surrounds all the points UA of a function of a single complex variable evaluated at those points. Okay, so now now we have to use uh, some theorems. You can evaluate, there is something called the residue at infinity, which you can evaluate exactly for this function, and it happens to be zero. Then the residue at infinity you compute another way as the negative of the sum of all the residues. If i and j are different, then f has no other poles. It is regular everywhere else. But if i and j are the same, then there is a simple pole with residue minus one. So that the residue of infinity, which is the sum of all these poles, is the the specific contour integral plus delta ij. So 
the sum evaluates the delta ij. Okay, so on paper, we can show this, it's true. If you compute this numerically, and you can laugh at me, this is, <laughs> epsilon and mu are only known to specific precision. And each time you take a difference, you have error that compounds fairly quickly and a lot faster than I expected. So if you compute this matrix for four by four, they are inverses, fine. But if you do an eight by eight case, they do not, they do not multiply to the identity matrix. You have something like 1.05 on the diagonal. That's not acceptable. So the, this specific thing is not something that's a problem, but things that are like it is a, are problems. So we have to uh, avoid this. And how do we avoid it? By just avoiding the numbers U altogether. So that is something we are trying to do. We have lots of problems for things that are almost zero. Then we get not a numbers that propagate and diagonalizing a matrix with one, not a number entry yields a result that is not particularly interesting. I found out that with NumPy you get one eigenvalue that's one and all the other eigenvalues are not a number. So these are problems that we have to work around. But the outlook is not so bad. So we're building methods for strong correlation using exact resolvable models as a starting point. In the near term, we are aiming to have methods that are systematically provable for everything that's fully paired. We have some issues that we need to work out, but we're going in this direction. The mean field is not expensive. It's end of the fourth or end of the fifth, depending on uh, what algorithm you use. The issues that remain to be solved for the mean field are generating a good initial guess for the parameters and what's the optimization. Perturbation theories and uh, configuration interaction approaches based on Richardson and Godin are also possible. The lower bound on the cost is probably end of the sixth. The upper, there is an upper bound on the cost. It's just, we don't know what it is. So it's labeled as a question mark. But we should get systematic improvement. That's the point. And as always, there are three separate problems we need to work. Initial guess for parameters, efficient evaluation of the objective function, and how do we solve these things numerically? So first and the third problems were main uh, issues. The second problem is, pre is solved in my opinion. Okay, the other point of this outlook is that we need to be able to treat things that are not just seniority zero. In the short term, we can add corrections with uh, approaches that exist. We can do that reasonably easily. In the long term, we want to add, um, we want to have a seniority non zero just in the first order picture. So we, we've looked at this using things that are not just closed shell single pairs. We have used open shell single pairs and built wave functions out of products of these. The results are pretty good for small systems that are difficult, but this is totally intractable. This is already an exponential cost calculation. So the point is that you can get them right with a mean field wave function, but the mean field is exponential. So we need ways to approximate this. So the examples are things that are very small systems that RHF and Doki are not good for. Admittedly, this, this is not the optimal Doki uh, curve, so sorry, Stain. But the mean field, which we've labeled as SPN and full CI are not, not so different. So there's a few of these systems. There's one where you have a, a square of hydrogen that opens up into a line. You have one where a line of hydrogen separates into two hydrogen molecules, which is again, difficult. You have a square of hydrogens that breaks into two separate hydrogen molecules. And you'll see there's, there's even a yon teller distortion at a small uh, distance. And there's a square of hydrogens that breaks into four individual hydrogens. These are notoriously difficult systems that we need to be able to treat correctly. So we look at them with our methods. Okay, so that is uh, all that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I have uh, a lot of people that are working very hard on this and have been supported by NSERC and Compute Canada in particular and the University of Lana. So if you are interested in interesting mathematics, in my opinion, in computer programming or in strongly correlated systems, I would encourage you to contact me because we are always looking for PhD students and there's a lot of different areas for these projects. So if you're interested, please contact me. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Paul. 
I'm sure Paul will be happy to address questions. Yeah, I had a question. Sure. Yeah, so um, so when you introduced this, uh, this pseudo spin operators, right, uh, the S plus, the minus, and the Z, so yep. then this will give you a state that has only uh, empty and doubly occupied uh, orbitals. That right? is correct. So, but if you did a particle hole transformation on the downspins, you could have the same structure, but then you would have only singly occupied orbitals, where, where, where then S would really be the actual spin operator. So I was wondering, yeah, if you had, okay. could you use uh, it together? Yeah, there's some uh, difficulties there because um, that, yeah. When you ask a question like that, I go directly to details, I'm sorry. Um, Your vacuum there is a fully polarized spin state in the down direction. So uh, the basis you would use for this calculation becomes very weird. So in each state you have, uh, in each orbital you can have four possible occupations. If you restrict yourselves to any two of those, you, you get the separation of zero impaired or up and down. But this is probably not what you were asking. Well, I, I, well it, it's just kind of a vague question, I guess. The question was just whether, uh, because I think you wanted to build this seniority. So you wanted to address states that had only one electron per orbital. And my yeah. question was just whether you could use somehow combined a basis that has uh, the zero and the twos and this basis that would have only a single occupations to kind of uh, get the best of both worlds. Um, yeah. Hey. Um, if, yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, well, well, we'll do this one thing at a time. So you can, you can add in unpaired electrons on their own. That's fine. They're not correlated with anything else. Or you can have a, a region, a region, a set of orbitals that either are up or down, and then a set of orbitals that are empty or full. Those two regions don't talk to each other, but that's a better approximation than just having independent electrons. Or you can have uh, things that are, you, you can have uh, things that are empty, fully paired, or have one. You have a lot more complication there in your mean field, and things just get more difficult to calculate. And the matrix elements are very complicated there, so that, that that's much longer term. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions for Paul? Stan has raised his hand. All right, Stan, I see a hand up. So, <laughs> so, so polite. Okay. You're learning to be Canadian already. Yes, <laughs> I'm lining up. Um, can you um, can you hear me? That's one thing. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I was a little intrigued by your um, so your H six and H eight restricted versus unrestricted orbitals. Yep. Um, would you like to see the K? Yes, I would like to see. These the are unpublished so curves. So, you know, the, the, yeah. so by the way, great, pro, great progress, Paul. <laughs> um, Turns out you can calculate anything brute force. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So um, the shoulder is pretty big. And for some reason, I was always under the impression that the shoulder or the, the let's say, the failure to, to go smoothly from, uh, let's say, delocalized to localized orbitals had to do with a shift in the, um, in, the, uh, in the nature of the orbitals, right? But then I would expect that, I would not expect this, 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 this shoulder. That is something, if you use the same orbital sets as a DOCI, then I would expect that the shoulder would not be there for the for the Richardson states. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, it is. I know. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> the, the nature of the RG solution changes on either side of the shoulder. It is an avoided crossing. All oh, right. So it is. Okay. 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 Oh. Oh. So this is actually a different a different Richardson solution. A different Richardson state that yes. the other states. Oh, okay. In uh, in H four it goes rather smoothly. In H eight it does not. All right, so I can see that. I can see that. Can you? Do you happen to know what the um, like the a rapidity structure is in this cross? Ah, uh, yeah, uh, it's in the, the mean field paper. Okay. So in the left, it's Hartree Fock. You have a G that's almost zero. Okay. On the right, it's a G that is either positive or negative. I don't think it matters. 
That's what I'm I, I was convinced that it did, and then I found a solution of the opposite sign, so it didn't matter. I don't. I don't think that is intermediate. I, at this association, the G is big. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. And I see there's a question from Igor. Go ahead, Igor. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, it, that's a question I already had with Stin's nice talk we had um, a few weeks ago. So this BCS, BCS Hamiltonian you show, um, that's probably not the full BCS Hamiltonian, right? But some oh, no. uh, off, or could, could you, could call you a make this explicit? Yes. So if if I just look at um, pairing of um, electrons, um, I think I would get maybe a different Hamiltonian. Yes, because there's kind of a mean field version of this Hamiltonian, which can be solved exactly. Um, and many mathematical theorems are known about it, but it's not really what condensed matter physicists are interested in. So I understand. So if you have an interaction that's like uh, VIJ and you can't separate that, that Hamiltonian is not exactly solvable. But you can use RG states as a as building blocks for the wave function. And I, uh, I think Stain has done that in that paper that's on the archive. I see. Thanks. I understand that this is not a physical Hamiltonian that you would use in the lab. The point is that you can use the eigenvectors of this thing as building blocks. All right. Thanks. Great. Any final questions for Paul? If not, join me in thanking Paul one more time for uh, another interesting quantum chemistry talk. It certainly helps my me and my students remember that, that those codes came from somewhere, that they just didn't magically appear. So thanks, Paul. Um, so a little quick applause. And then I'll remind um, people that I think there is still another set of TPI talks. Joseph can jump in and remind me. I think we're not quite at the end of the semester yet. That's right, yeah. So there will be one more talk uh, and that is going to be April uh, the 8th at four o'clock at Minton time. So you're very welcome to uh, end this last talk of the semester. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. I'm sure uh, Paul can stay around for a couple more minutes if, uh, if people have other questions, but otherwise we can stop recording and sign off for 